Hello, and welcome to Poetry Soundbite, a new series of poetry readings and interviews available at As It Ought To Be Magazine. I'm Chase Dimmick, Managing Editor of As It Ought To Be Magazine, proud to host our fourth installment of the series with our guest today, John Dorsey. In a quick and tidy 30 to 45 minutes, we will learn a little bit about John, hear some of his poems, and explore how he crafts his work. Our poem selections and questions came from my students in my Intro to Poetry class at College of the Canyons, who are helping me put together these interviews as part of our Living Poet Project. I thought it would be a cool way to teach poetry as a living, vital art form and encourage participating in the poetry community by reading and meeting real live poets. So today I have with us John Dorsey coming to us from Missouri. And just a little bit about John, here is his biography. So John Dorsey lived for years in Toledo, Ohio. He is the author of several, and I mean several, collections of poetry, including Teaching the Dead to Sing, The Outlaw's Prayer, Sodomy is a City in New, in New Jersey, Tombstone Factory, Appalachian Frankenstein, which is one of my favorites, Being the Fire, Shoot the Messenger, Your Daughter's Country, which Way to the River, Selected Poems of 2016 to 2020, and The Prettiest Girl at the Dance. His work has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, Best of the Net, and the Stanley Hanks Memorial Poetry Prize. He is the winner of the 2019 Terry Award given out at Poetry Rendezvous. He can be reached at archers at yahoo.com. And so today, John is gonna read a selection of poems from one of my favorite books of his called Sick. And it's actually a split book. He wrote half of it along with uh, fellow Missouri poet, Dan Crocker. And John's work uh, in this portion primarily talks about his childhood growing up with cerebral palsy and all of the challenges associated with this. So without further ado, let's welcome John Dorsey. How are you doing, John? I'm just fine, Chase. It's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. I always love it when we get a chance to work on things. And this is your second time actually working with my students here at College of the Canyons. Uh, yeah, that, that is correct. I had a, uh, uh, Victor Clevenger and I were there in the fall of 2019 and we had, uh, we had a wonderful time. Yeah, so I'm glad that we get the chance to beam you back into our community. Um, and you're out here quite often. I'm looking forward to the next time you come out to Venice um, to read at Beyond Baroque. Uh, yeah, that will um, that will be relatively soon. I've had some talks about that already, and uh, someone has already promised me a large steak dinner at Musso and Frank's. So, oh my God, that is uh, couple that with Gus's fried chicken, and um, that's worth the the bus ride right there from Missouri. It's true. It certainly is. And for those that don't know, um, like some of my students might not know, uh, Beyond Baroque is a foundation in Venice, and it's like kind of like the underground holy grail of poetry. It's an old um, old building from like almost 100 years ago. It's huge, and it's got a poetry um, bookstore. It's got an event space, and they keep the underground poetry scene alive in Los Angeles. So all the great writers of that milieu have passed through it, including John Dorsey, several times. Uh, yes, Beyond Broke has been um, a Los Angeles staple. They've been there since 1969. Um, and their bookstore is named after my late friend, uh, the late Scott Wandberg. Mm. And um, yeah, they do have quite a history. People like Bob Flanagan were there um, in the 70s. The Groundlings were there. Um, that's where Paul Rubens first sketched out Pee Wee Herman. That's things. crazy. I didn't know. I did not know that. Yeah, I'd say it's a really interesting place and their theater has such a such a diverse history. That's so cool. So definitely um, once they reopen and have events again, check out Beyond Baroque. It's the best venue for live poetry in Los Angeles. So why don't we get started with our readings? So I wanted to start you with uh, two poems from your collection. Um, and I like this because um, uh, my student noticed how you kind of uh, evaluate over time your experience of illness and your experience of cerebral palsy. And so she highlighted two of them. So if you could read At 16 and How It Goes Now. 
Okay. Um, at 16. At 16, it seemed like everyone drove a car but me. As Chris and I walked to the bowling alley on my birthday, I wrote stories on my arm in doll ink faded by the sun. My muscles weak, swerving out of control. We were all just looking for a way to escape that long walk home. And then, let's see here, find the other poem. Um, how it goes now. And this is a poem that has as much to do with growing up with cerebral palsy as it is to be growing older with cerebral palsy. How it goes now. The other day I fell and landed on my back, smacking my head on the cement. I already take enough ibuprofen to kill a horse. The government says I'm not disabled enough to get a check. That's all right. We all misjudge our steps sometimes. We've all woken up shaking in the middle of the night. Excellent. And I love how those two poems bookend here. And so my student, Naomi Stevenson, recognized that. And so here's her question. And she mentions a third poem, but I want you to read that a little bit later. I've noticed that your poems take us through your life, for example, at 16, the benefits of cerebral palsy at 15, which we'll read in a little bit, and how it goes now, and so on. A lot of poets have the tendency to completely generalize their past into one poem, and therefore one emotion. Yet you take us through your life by stages. Some stages show depression, some stages show thankfulness. What made you want to take us through your life in this way, and not simply generalize your childhood into one poem, as so many poets do? Um, I, you know, that's a good question. Um, the poets that I like, that I enjoy, don't tend to generalize. So that's, you know, that comes into my process. But also, I am, uh, I'm a person like we all are, and our lives are made up of different moments. And we all have highlights we know that we do, that we think back on. And um, knowing that life is made up of like a bunch of of different like interchangeable parts um you know that really impacts my process it's not just one thing and cerebral palsy itself as a disability at times can be so up and down that it's not just a straight line um you know it can you you could come into it and it'll be what it is you, your cerebral palsy could be degenerative um and you, the experience for everyone is so different. So why wouldn't the parts of a poem be different as well? Uh, that's sort of my short answer. Well, I like what you said that that um, if you were to generalize your entire child your entire childhood of cerebral palsy into one poem, it would be an inaccurate vision of what it was because, like you said, it's up and down. So you would need a poem that it so many sketches of of um, the experience and each sketch needs a poem. Uh, yeah, and I think this will be a weird thing to say, but I'm grateful for having been born with cerebral palsy in that um, I feel like it made my experience, my experience, it made it more unique um, and you deal with what you deal with, but I'm, I'm proud of being a person with cerebral palsy and like the challenges that I've dealt with, um, you know, you, you shouldn't feel, you shouldn't feel bad. I, I wouldn't say feel good about it either, but it just, um, yeah, it, she talked about how there are moments of thankfulness and moments of depression. And, um, you know, largely, I don't think cerebral palsy has brought me a lot of depression but there are times where I have been tr truly thankful. Um, my, my life could have been far, like my, my, where my cerebral palsy is, it could have been far worse than it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
I, I don't know. I, I'm just very grateful for the experience, very grateful to be able to write about the experience. I like that. I like I like the terms of uh, gratefulness and optimistic and optimism. And that leads perfectly into our next poem. Um, Disability in the Age of Disco, The New Hope. Yeah, which anyone who's seen Star Wars knows the New Hope part is uh, the, the reference to that. Disability in the Age of Disco, The New Hope. In 1977, they kept me in a heated machine meant for a creature the size of a baby bird. I weighed just over three pounds and cried through the night. A few weeks out of the hospital, my parents took me to the drive-in to see Star Wars. As palm trees swayed above my head, they were young and just happy that I was alive. And everything else just seemed like a galaxy far, far away. Excellent. And by the way, totally by accident, I picked up my vintage oh, Star Wars sweet. mug. I know, total, nice. total accident. It's not even mine, it's my mother's. Um, <laughs> so anyway, speaking of Star Wars and the late 70s, my student Brigitte Salazar asks, the title of your poem, Disability in the Age of Disco, The New Hope, stood out to me since it highlighted two iconic aspects of the 70s. This poem also felt more optimistic than some of your other pieces, which made me wonder if it's due to the young ages you and your parents were that night at the drive-in. What does being born in this decade mean to you? Uh, so you got to reflect on the late 70s. Yeah, I, you know, I'll say that um, one of the things that I reference in the poem is that I w actually was in an incubator when I was born, and I spent the first three months of my life um, in intensive care in the hospital, a military hospital in Hawaii. Um, so by the spring of 1977 or thereabouts, like my parents were just very grateful that I had made it through. And one of the first things they did when they took me home, I think I'd only been home for about a week and they took me to the drive-in to see Star Wars, which is where that poem comes from. And my dad said, all I did was cry the entire time. <laughs> um, um, in, in terms of being born in the 70s, um, I, I think the poem does express a optimism because of the youth of my parents. Um, I think the 70s were perhaps a more optimistic time. At least I feel more optimistic about them than our current culture. Um, and having been born in the 70s, what it means to me is that I'm, I'm not really, as I talked to you about a little bit before we went on, Chase, I'm not really part of the cell phone culture. Um, I don't really have my phone chained to me, which weirds out even people that are older than me. It's just not a thing I think about. Um, I lost my phone on Sunday because I just don't keep it on me. I hadn't seen it in like three days. Uh, you know, it just, yeah, it was just, it was just a different time, the more innocent time. And um, as depressed as I can get, I need that. I, I need that innocence and I need that sort of joy just to keep it going. And uh, that's what keeps the poems going. I like that. And it's funny too, also that, um, the pandemic changed the fabric of our society for a while. Um, and in some ways we became more of that phone dependent, technology dependent, distanced um, culture that you don't associate with optimism. And yet a couple of things came back, including the drive-in movie. Like at least here in LA, drive-ins popped up everywhere they could possibly pop up. And anything for about a year, anything you could do in your car suddenly became, came back again in a way that hadn't been here for decades. Well, I, for, for myself, I hope that remains the case. I love the drive-in. It's, uh, it's an American treasure. Um, and I know that California has the most in the United States. They actually, you have uh, 52 drive-ins there. Wow. I mean, because I like I do not know where the nearest working 
drive-in is. Um, I mean, I can poke around LA and show you where the drive-ins used to be. Like uh, here in my my parents' neighborhood in Simi Valley, that's where the um, the drive-in is now a uh, huge complex of trailers where old people live. Um, and a bunch of them got, most of them got turned into housing over in LA because the land is just so valuable, but lots of pop-up drive-ins are coming around mm. these days, you know, because the technology is, you, know, you can get huge screens and super powerful projectors that are pretty inexpensive and you can bring that back now. Well, I was, I was living in Santa Cruz in the mid 2000s for a while. And I'll, I'll tell you what, the dri going to the drive in there was one of my favorite, favorite things. So I didn't realize you were in Santa Cruz during the mid 2000s. Yeah, for a little while. I had what a year? girlfriend. Uh, most of like 2005. Oh, wow. I would have been there. Um, yeah, I had a girlfriend who was, <laughs> who was German. Um, who was living there and I, I moved in with her for a while and uh, it was that was a that was a really good time in my life not too many pressures but uh, one of the wonderful things that has come about for me because of the pandemic is that I started handwriting letters to people again oh I love that and uh, so I have about 10 people that are on my regular rotation where I write them letters about every two weeks wow and that's a different you know, how, how does um, writing a letter by hand uh, differ from how you would write your poems? Uh, you know, it, it allows, for me, writing poems is such a quick process at times because you have a, something come in your head. I, I think writing a letter gives you the time to be thoughtful about what you're going to put down on paper, um, at least for me. So it it may take me like three or four days to write a letter. Whereas if I'm writing a poem, it will probably take me three or four minutes because it's a, just a quick flash. Wow. And that's funny too, because like when I write a letter, I'm like more like, more like you as a poet where I'm like, I'm just dashing my thoughts down informally. And then when I try to write a poem, I agonize it over it. Like I'm trying to write a letter to somebody that uh, I really want to communicate something very special specific but also profound to and I'm not sure how they're going to react and every word gets fraught yeah it's um yeah the the, ner the letters make me nervous sometimes because I know who they're going to mm -hmm. um, with poems like the beauty of poetry is that you can reach so many people that you may never meet or never hear from in your entire life and I think that is awesome mm -hmm. and the burden of thinking about how they will react to your work goes away because they're just out there in the ether. Whereas for me with a letter, I, I very much know who's going to read it. And so I have to give it some real pause. Interesting. So it's kind of like the poem for you is kind of like writing a letter to a person, to somebody who you don't know it's going to go to, and it'll just go out there into the world. And eventually it'll drift into the hand of the person who needed to receive it. It's true. And I, I always tell people, whether it's in talking to a class or whatever, that nine times out of 10, what you take away or what they take away from the piece of writing that they have read of mine isn't necessarily what I took away from the experience. And I, and I think that's wonderful that we can all get something different, something that we need from one particular piece of writing. I'm totally um, I'm on board with that idea. In fact, I had a question um, that I'm going to ask a little bit later that's specifically about what I see in your work. Um, but before then, why don't we jump to the next poem? And this one is a short one called The Benefits of Cerebral Palsy at 15. Okay. The benefits of cerebral palsy at 15. If I had any dexterity in my right hand at all, I would have tried to cut my wrist. Wow. That's really, that one's really effective when you see it just alone on a piece of paper. 
like the starkness of all the white blank paper around it makes that punch even harder. Um, and I think that uh, Sophia, uh, so sorry, I flubbed that. I think my student Sophia Estrada noticed the same thing when she asks, in the poem, The Benefits of Cerebral Palsy at 15, you talk about suicide in a way that the ending is the punchline. How did you get there? And I think she's absolutely right that there's just a punch at the end. Um, you know, I, I try to end all of my poems. I think we hope that we're gonna get to some sort of like gut punch at the end of the poem, no matter what it's about. Um, in terms of how I got there, that poem for me is just very, uh, it's very true. Like if I had to use my right hand really to do anything, um, I can't even, I can hardly pick up, pick up a coffee cup with my right hand. And, you know, I think when we're teenagers, we deal with, well, we deal with depression now as adults, but I, I think particularly as teenagers and that the poem for me is just a small true statement about where I was at 15. And it was a hard time um, trying to figure myself out. I tried to talk to my parents about it. And they were just like, oh, you, you'll be okay. You're, you're fine. Like, which actually, you know, uh, made it worse. Um, but, um, you know, and I later on, I, I thought about suicide. And I thought about the fact that if I had attempted it, I really am not sure, like, if I was to try to use my hand to do that particular thing, whether it could do it. And in the end, um, you know, not still, still being here in the world is probably a much better result because I wouldn't have gotten to write uh, the poems that I've written. So I'm glad that those like darker moments in my youth didn't uh, play out. I know that really doesn't answer the question, but that is just. Yeah. Oh, I, however you got there is the right answer. Um, I think that the punch of that poem is that there's a strange and beautiful irony put into just four lines that here you have, um, you've been um, struggling with something that at 15 made you so desperate and down. And yet the symptoms of the thing that was bringing you down includes the thing that was saving your life. So the thing that you're most down about is also the thing that's saving you. And I think that that extends to a lot of things in our life where um, we think something is killing us, but it's actually preventing us from being killed. We think it's hurting us, but it might actually be saving us. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I, th I think that you can attest too that, you know, when you write a poem, sometimes mm -hmm. you have to go to a darker place, or mm -hmm. sometimes that poem brings up emotions that maybe you didn't want to dredge up. But I think the act of writing that poem, and for me, finding poetry in my life, all of it, really did save my life. It's the only reason I'm still here talking to you now. And I mean, I, I can feel, I can definitely connect to that because um, as a teenager, that was me as well. I was writing lots and lots of not particularly great poems, um, but that doesn't, it doesn't matter if they were great. What mattered was that I was finding an outlet for that kind of teenage angst and working through a lot of stuff in a way that was productive and therapeutic and then laid a groundwork for, um, it was like practice, it was like reps. It was like uh, running laps and um, doing gym workouts that prepared me for being able to, when I'm a little bit more mature, um, and a little bit more circumspect and a little bit more understanding of the world to write something better. But yeah, um, I, I feel the same way. I, yeah, I was writing really awful poems, I will admit that, uh, inspired by Hart Crane. Um, oh, I love Hart Crane. Oh, I, lo I love him too. And um, it was one of my first really big influences in poetry. But uh, you know, the density of his work and what he writes about and his life um, are perhaps not things that'll uh, bring joy 
into your life. He really what he was a very depressed person himself. And mm-hmm. I don't know, like, because he was young, like me, he wasn't 15 at that time. But I felt like, well, some of his experience, I, I really could relate to it. And that's so fascinating, because right before we started the, the show, we talked about how we both liked the new work that's being done to uh, rediscover uh, voices of um, specifically gay male poets, but LGBT queer people in general who kind of were overlooked over the decades. And Hart Crane, that's uh, that's going back 90 years to um, one of my favorite eras of writing, the, the modernists in the 1920s, where a lot of gay writers came out in their work in America for the first time. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I'll always talk about historically is where do young queer people find the voices that they need to hear in a world where, you know, they're constantly being told to stay in the closet or be ashamed of themselves and denied the information they need. You know, I didn't get the internet till I was 12 or 13. So, you know, I had to look in a library. And so early writers, um, especially, but I think that that's interesting that, um, you know, you don't need to have been um, gay to have heard Hart Crane and what he was going through and say, he's speaking to my experience as well. No, definitely not. I I felt some sort of, uh, the first time I read, I read a poem of his called Black Tambourine. And uh, I can tell you, I can remember that it made me cry for Mm -hmm. quite a long time. I really, really, my, I was lucky enough that my mom's sister uh, had a bunch of dusty old books in her studio. And one of them was, an anthology called The Treasury of American Poetry, edited by Nancy Sullivan, um, and Hart Crane was in there. And mm-hmm. um, and I think Black Tambourine was probably the very first poem I ever read. Wow. Yeah, and um, my scotch of choice is Cuddy Sark because of oh. that was his favorite. Um, yeah, and I read, I, I read, a, he, but <laughs> I don't think I'll ever get to the, hope, <laughs> hopefully never get to the point that he did. Yeah, ho- hopefully not. I don't wish that on you. Uh, yeah, his Cuddy Sark. Or anybody, yeah. No, no. His Cuddy Sark poem is great. Um, I prefer the stuff in white buildings over the bridge, but I will, I'll take all of it. Yeah, absolutely. So that was, that's what I love about doing these uh, interviews as kind of off the cuff, spur of the moment. Like I had no idea we would be talking about Hart Crane today. And by the <laughs> way, I know that a lot of my students are uh, really big into uh, LGBT writers and queer expressions of the past. So definitely check out Hart Crane. If you haven't read Hart Crane, read Hart Crane. So yes. I had a couple of questions because there's two poems in here that are two of my favorite of your poems, period. And you're extremely prolific. That's like, that's picking two out of thousands and thousands of poems. But I would love it if you could read two poems for me, which you read to my students when you were here in College of the Canyons live two years ago. And they are, Mr. Wilson had a seahorse and Tim Yost wore a sailor suit. Yeah, I can do that. I'll read read this one first. Um, Okay, this is uh, Tim Yost wore a sailor suit. Tim Yost wore a sailor suit and had physical therapy in the same room as me. He was so fat that when they threw a ball at him, it would just bounce off his stomach. He would just giggle, jollier than Santa Claus at the first sight of a snowflake in winter. He'd talk about fishing trips he'd never get to go on. His father always said, Someday, I'd struggle to understand him. He came into this world a few months early, just like me. We were all shoved into a single room, no matter what your issue was. On Fridays, they made popcorn, salted and placed in brown paper bags. And we watched the same movie on a reel-to-reel projector almost every single week. The hero wasn't like any of us. He could go fishing any time he wanted and could swing words always easy to understand, like a sword 
on his tongue. Let's see here. All right. Mr. Wilson had a seahorse and Mr. Wilson was my second grade teacher. Mr. Wilson had a seahorse on the corner of his desk. He told me I walked like a duck, flapping his wings in front of the class to illustrate his point. He made my friend Mark piss himself instead of letting him go to the bathroom after he started to cry. Even after his father died, Mark refused to tear up because he didn't want anything running down his face that reminded him of salt water. Damn. That definitely has that final gut punch line at the end. And so this goes back to what we were saying earlier about how when you send a poem out into the world, you don't know who's going to receive it. And then on top of that, you don't know what they're going to receive out of it. And so my question about it is more about what, how I received it in a way that's very specific to my life and my profession, which you would not necessarily have predicted. Because um, I was thinking about the impact of teachers and education in those two poems. So I want to ask you that the reason why I wanted you to read these two poems is because they both reflect on your experience in school and how the behaviors of teachers and limited opportunities in these institutions of education impacted you and other classmates. To me, they are powerful reminders of why education that stresses empathy and attention to the individual needs of a student are important. These memories seem so fresh and present in these poems. I'm wondering, is this experience in school something you reflect on often and carry with you? How did your experience in school impact your desire to write and how you craft your work? So you can see, I was thinking of it from being a teacher and realizing, man, uh, in both poems, these kids got sucker punched in horrible ways by teaching and by institutionalized education that wasn't there to benefit them. And that like, like was, it made me real, it, it made me realize, okay, I need to commit. I already always try to be as empathetic as I possibly can when I teach, but this shows it goes so far in how you impact young people. Yeah, I, you know, uh, I was, when I was seven years old, I, you know, obviously I was born with cerebral palsy, but when I was seven years old, I was diagnosed with having a learning disability. Um, you know, in between being seven and being, by the time I was 12, they put me in a 12th grade history class um, because it wasn't that I was unintelligent. It was just a matter of how uh, they taught me in that teaching process. And those, these poems reflect like the majority of the educators that I dealt with during that time, which were, it was saying that it was unsupportive really doesn't go far enough. It was in a lot of ways, a negative experience. Uh, you were treated like you were inferior. And I, I am still friends to this day with like four or five of the guys that I was in class with because we actually um, were kept in the same homeroom class from the time I was in second grade, to sixth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had, you had the same teacher. Um, but in terms of how it impacted my writing, um, it just made me push harder because I can remember so many times uh, people told us what we couldn't do as opposed to what we could do. I can tell you, even when I got older, this would have been in like the 11th or 12th grade, I had an English teacher that I can remember. I was applying for colleges and instead of like being supportive, I remember saying, well, college isn't for everyone. Uh, and, you know, to start off with a negative statement, like it just oh. was sort of ridiculous. Um, now I had, I had a few teachers that I, they were really angels that were, I can think of one or two people that I would not be here if not for them, but that by and large, that wasn't the experience. But the reason why I write as much as I do today, the reason why I am a college graduate is because people told me I couldn't do things. Wow. So, so I did them anyway. Wow. And that's, I mean, it's powerful to hear that because um, it just, it blows my mind that you would ever have a teacher at any level, K through 
uh, doctoral level um, advisor that would ever go into the situation saying, you can't do this, or education is not for you. Um, it just it boggles my mind. And yet I think that's an old school mentality where it's almost like where you have that drill instructor boot camp mentality of, well, let's winnow everybody out. Um, but that tells us in that, in that system, education is not premised on the uplift of the individual, but about um, molding people into the interests of society. And so thus let's winnow out the people that we've decided aren't useful. And in the past that's meant horrible discrimination against people based on their race, their gender, their sexuality, uh, religion, class, um, ability in, um, in your case and some of your friends that you talked about in the, in the book. Um, you know, so it makes me, it, rem it reminds me that that type of mentality of the boot camp type of teaching is based not on what's good for the individual that you're supposed to teach, but it's about, it, it's rooted in a lot of discrimination. Yeah, I, I think for me, like, I benefited because my father was in the military. And so not only did I deal with that in the educational system, I dealt with a lot of it at home as well. So I think had it not been a part of my life on both levels, that teachers might have broken me in some way. And I mm -hmm. feel like I went the other way. Um, you know, I think about the Middle Ages, where if you had had cerebral palsy at that time, they just throw you off the side of a cliff or something like that. So, you know, yeah. we definitely have made some advancements, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and college, come... mm -hmm. oh, yeah sorry, go ahead. Co college became something else that I can't, I don't really have any negative things to say there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, yeah, I guess, again, um, the reason why I wanted you to read that is it goes back to exactly what you said, that you don't know what somebody's going to receive out of a poem. And that um, something you might not think is your best goes out there and it says something to somebody who needed to hear it. And this one hits me at, a, at one of my most um, fraught places in who I am because I always struggle with the idea of I want to be as empathetic, as supportive, as um, helpful. And that's tough to do when you have so many students and so many people that you're um, looking out for. So um, it just boggles my mind then when I see somebody's, ex when I see an example like this, um, you know, and I also in grade school, like uh, special education has come so far since the time you were in school in the early eighties. Um, my mother does a lot of um, special education teaching and, um, you know, in the past it used to be, that was just the room that you shoved the students that you didn't think had any potential into. Yes. And now it's um, a concentrated, um, refined pedagogy uh, by people who have been studying for years and working for years and have a specific passion in this idea of different learning styles and different abilities and being able to recognize the fact that education, again, is not about testing to a test, you know, testing for a grade, testing for a job, but should be about the uplift of every individual in our society. Yeah, I, I think that now in our present culture, we've talked a lot about bullying as, as a mm -hmm. subject. Um, but what I don't think we've delved into enough is like what you say, like in the early 80s, there was a lot of bullying that had nothing to do with the students. It was the educators at that time. Um, and I can tell you from my own personal experience, there are a couple of guys that I came up with in that special education classes that committed suicide. There was just, wow. it, it was, it was a, it was a rough time, rougher than people will talk about. But I also feel like that's part of why I wrote the poems and why I'll probably write more of them is I feel personal responsibility to some of those people that literally aren't here anymore. Wow. That's just, that's just such a powerful statement. Um, and one of the things I like to bring up, because I like to talk about um, disability studies when I do literary theory, um, because I think talking about um, the way in which we take for granted the body and make assumptions on what a body should do and ideally would do 
you know, there's been lots of really interesting work, including this, including your book that sheds light on that. And one of the things that blows people's minds is um, the Americans with Disability Act doesn't happen until about 1990. You know, yes. so the idea that you had to have ramps for wheelchairs and parking for the disabled and everything else that comes out of it. Um, you know, I just asked my students, you know, have you ever hiked from the parking at the bottom all the way to the top of the university center? Could you imagine trying to do that, um, you know, if you um, were on crutches or in a wheelchair and you had to go, you know, no, that's why we have the parking up close. I mean, you've even experienced that, how, you know, on our campus, you have to hike. Um, and without those type of accommodations, you wouldn't be able to go to school. No, it's true. And I, I wore a leg brace myself until I was 14. Uh, but because I, I worked with two different therapists, I was eventually able to not have to use it anymore. But I, I definitely understand that. There's a, there was a wonderful film that came out a number of years ago now called The Music of Change, which is about um, the passage of that the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because we don't think of that as a civil rights legislation, but it absolutely is. Oh, of course it is, yeah. yeah that, that, that in an era in which disabled people were not given equal access to the, the things that we're all entitled to, you know, the ability to walk into a courtroom, the ability to walk into a library, um, the ability to um, have devices that you can actually hear what your teacher is saying. Um, all of those things are barriers to the equal access to the things that we all have the rights to. Yeah, it's, um, you know, as with, sadly, as with so many things in this world, unless you have to go through it, um, it just seems like an abstraction. It seems like such a foreign thing. And I, I understand that, but that's part of why I said that I was grateful for my experience because, you know, you just have a deeper understanding in, in your better moments of what people go through. Yeah, I like that idea is that it's that one of the best things you can get out of going through a struggle or feeling like an outcast is that it could teach you empathy. It teaches you the fact that you, at some point, hopefully you make that connection other people are going through something like this. It might not be the version I'm going through of this. You know, you're talking about dealing with um, discrimination due to your disability. I could talk about uh, discrimination due to being from the LGBT community. And part of what that taught me is the fact that at an early age, I, late teens, I realized that this is a like, but not the same as, um, what somebody who's feeling a different type of discrimination would be going through. Um, so even though I don't know from personal experience what it's like, I do understand what happens psychologically when the world um, shuts itself off to you and, and wants to uh, marginalize you. And I, I know that you do. And I, you know, I think that I can't speak for you, but I would say that you, there are probably elements of that experience that while they are not ideal, you're grateful for having gone through them. Oh, absolutely so. Um, you know, I, I always bring this up to my friends as a thought experiment is, uh, you know, what do you see in the world and go, oh, thank God I'm gay. Hmm. <laughs> you know, that Thank God, you know, I don't have to um, deal with that, or thank God, um, my experience has put me in a position where I am grateful for. And yeah, I, I love the fact that, you know, it's connected me to people that I may never have met, um, got me involved in things I may never have been involved in. Um, and then I think especially since I grew up white, male, upper middle class in the suburbs, um, it made me understand the privilege that comes with that experience much earlier than maybe I would have had I not had to, had I, you know, sometimes you just don't understand things until it happens to you, oh, especially sure. when you're, when the whole world is catered to you the way it is to um, people that grew up in that subject position. Yeah, the, the thing I find myself saying more than anything now is, thank God I was born in the 70s, going, going back to that. I. 
Um, I, I don't know. I would not, you could not pay me to be 25 during the pandemic. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy with my experience. Yeah, that would have been, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. I, I feel, and obviously my students are going to hear this, but, uh, you know, I feel terrible for the fact that they're trying to get their education in such a trying time. And my hat is off to you guys for how much effort it takes to focus on something like, I mean, this is a poetry class. You're reading poems and writing my assignments while the world is on fire. But maybe we need, even when the world's on fire, we still need art. Uh, we, I think we especially need art while the world is on fire. And I think that we have e not even yet to see the great poetry that's gonna come out of this time during the pandemic. So in a strange way, I'm grateful for that. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm also like, I'm also very grateful that I could like go to an airport and pick up someone at their gate before nine 11. And mm -hmm. so to have that experience too, it's very well-rounded, but yeah, I, you know, my, my hats off to young people out there. Like, um, just, uh, there, there will be a lot for them to write about. Well, I like, I think that's a really good place to wrap things up on your, optimistic upswing on this because I'm I'm with you on that that uh if people can get through this it makes the big challenges that we've been talking about for a while in our future seem more approachable so anyway I'm going to wrap things up here so I want to once more thanks John Dorsey for being our guest and reading our reading some poems for us um any last words John uh, no, I just want to say that it's, well, yeah, I want to say that it's been wonderful to be here today. I, it's been much more, a lot of times I will get myself stressed out and this has been a joyful like experience. So I thank you, Chase. All right. Well, thank you. And again, I'm looking forward to the next time you and I can collaborate on something. Always love working with you. Well, hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later. And in person. Yeah. I hope coming, so. out to, coming out to California soon. Yes. Cool. Well, take care, John, and thank you, everybody, for listening.